This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very special treat for all you obscure, low-budget slasher movie fans out there. I will be talking to Cecilia Fannin. She played the lady artist who gets slaughtered in Don't Go in the Woods, which celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. And I'm going to have her on today, and we're going to talk about that movie. She's also a very prolific writer. She teaches writing. Um, you know, she's written books, she's written plays, I guess. We're going to talk about all of that stuff. Um, her husband, Jonathan Bliss, he, um, also worked on the movie as well. And I guess either, I, I don't know how they got together. Either they met on that movie or they knew or they were together already. And they both, you know, got hired to work on that movie. I don't know what the situation is. But uh, we are going to talk about it today, and I cannot wait. Uh, Halloween October is getting better and better, and it's going to keep getting better and better. Just all of you wait. So yeah, here is my interview with Cecilia Fannin. Hello? Hey, Cecilia. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Good. I'm putting you on speaker. That's perfect. That's what every that's what everyone does. <laughs> yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, so I have asthma, and I was just <laughs> using some inhaler. Oh, that's okay. My, my voice exercises. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh my goodness, an honor. That's an interesting characterization of forty years ago. Absolutely. Oh my God, when I was young. <laughs> but before we talk about Don't Go in the Woods, let's go back in time. Did you gravitate toward acting and writing early on in your childhood? Let's see. Uh, yes, acting. I think I had a family of theatrical people. I grew up in New York City, in the suburbs, in Flushing, New York, in a two-family house. And uh, my cousins, four cousins, lived downstairs, and they all had aspirations to be, um, you know, way too young for this, but the Lennon sisters. And then one of my cousins actually did become uh, an actress. And I thought I had the bug, but I, when the lights went on, I went off. So I was not destined to be an actor, except in this rare exception of um, don't go in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question. I didn't really have aspirations. I just wanted to be like my cousins, who were uh, uh, much more, much much more talented than I could ever hope to be. However, I did watch them a lot, so I became a writer. You know, I made the observations right. and the and the smart remarks <laughs> and the criticism. Yeah. Was was there any books or move or any books or movies that? Um, that really inspired you? God, books and movies. You know, um, or plays? In early uh, yeah, plays. My father was interested in plays, so he always took us from fucking way into the city, which was a distance of about 13 and a half miles. Mm -hmm. And uh, a neighbor actually took me in to see Camelot, and I was about six years old, and I'm not sure six years, six years old, were allowed in the theater at that time. But I saw Julie Andrews and Robert Goulet on Broadway. I had no idea what was going on, but it was an early introduction to these formidable talents on the New York stage. And then I saw other plays that I probably wasn't supposed to see either, uh, like Beckett and things like that. Uh, it was interesting, uh, an interesting childhood. Yeah. Sort of semi demi theater. And then, of course, we were all crazy about movies. Uh, flashing forward in time, mm -hmm. uh, way forward, uh, Jim Bryan, who went to, he would be about eight or nine or maybe ten years older than I am. Yeah. He uh, went to UCLA film school. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he was living in Utah, where I was. So I had gravitated toward uh, another part of theater, which was dancing. 
mm-hmm. which is where I discovered I didn't belong to dancing either because people are actually looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't, at least you didn't have to talk and make a fool of yourself. So, right. Uh, only to sell on the stage. Anyway, it was so impressive in Utah that he had, Jim Bryant had gone to UCLA film school and gotten a master's degree. It was like a miracle. Uh, it was like harder than becoming a, a senator. Those are, there are 50 positions there available, right? Or, or 100, excuse me. 100 positions available as senator. But in UCLA film school and then master's program, 20 people get in mm-hmm. a year. So it's tough. Uh, of course, that's not quite the right math. You get the idea. So we thought he was uh, a sort of a demigod at the time. And um, he asked us to help him make a movie. And everybody did everything on don't go in the woods, the classic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did you... Years later, I, I went to U, UCLA film school after I was a, a playwright and after I already had some bona fides in tele, having written for television. But I decided to go back and get a master's degree in film. And I did. And it was to Jim Bryant's alma mater. But at, by that point, I had long since lost touch with him. Yeah. So I, did you did you have uh, interviewed him? I'm sorry. Have you interviewed Jim Bryan? Funny you should ask that. I, I he was he was the first person I reached out to before you, and he's got uh, major health problems. He told me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I'm very sorry to hear that. Like he told he told me he's like he wouldn't be a good interview. So, yeah, he had to pass, but he would have done it otherwise. You know so. Yeah, it always breaks my heart when something like that, like something like that happens. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I wanted to interview Valerie Perrine, but she's had Parkinson's for quite a while, and she chatters when she talks, and because of it, she's lost her teeth. And she's such a great lady, though. Like, um, like she's written me a couple messages on Twitter and stuff. So that's <clears throat> always a good feeling, even though you know I can't interview her. Well, I guess I can't ask you a question, but maybe at the end of the interview I will. But that, that's, that's, it is sad to hear. Um, so I, uh, I'm alive and well and healthy. I have just had asthma, but I've had that for years. In fact, that's yeah. why I left Salt Lake, because the air quality was so bad. Right. Um, I had been in the dance department and then came to California and you know, worked some in television and then became a playwright. Um, and had some successes. So life has taken, drifted this way and that. And I'm still writing, but I'm still healthy. The woman who is harpooned to a canvas uh, <laughs> as an artist in Don't Go in the Woods. And yes. uh, that was a, if you wanted to hear about that particular incident, that's kind of yes. kind of a funny story. Yes, that's what, no. that's what I'm about to ask. Well, I was curious, though, really quick, though. Uh, were you and Jonathan together already when um, that came about? Yes. So Jonathan is um, about two years older than I am, and he met Jim Bryan through the Sun Classic Pictures. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sun Classic did Grizzly Adams, I'm sure you already know this, and yeah. uh, they did... Um, uh, the hit, we used to call it the hysterical Jesus, but there was a series called Historical Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's how they met. Jim Bryan was working as a sound editor, and he was, as I said, big star from UCLA Film School who uh, was in Utah. And because Jonathan was literary manager, which didn't re- really mean very much, he just got to reject a lot of people's scripts at some classic pictures. That's how he met Jim, and we became friends, and Jim was married to Kathy Bryan at the time, and she was an enormously talented, I mean, it's so talented, and this is not like my cousins who thought they were the Lennon sisters, this was true, <laughs> she did everything. She did everything from the set paintings to every single costume that you've ever seen in every movie that Jim tried to make, yeah. plus, she was, she was a fantastic painter and won contests all over the country. I mean, she really was a formidable, but she could, find, she could make props, she could make Christmas trees, she could make lodgepole pines. I mean, I, I can't describe how, her, her talent, and I found after you got, 
contacted me that she yeah. passed two and a half years ago. Oh. Which I'm so sorry to hear. However, she was a huge smoker. Mm -hmm. She smoked these brown cigarettes, and I think that did her in. But she was a lovely and deeply talented woman. So, I don't know. You should interview younger people. <laughs> I don't do that because younger people are jealous. I've had a lot of drama with them. I'd rather interview the older people. I've always That's an interesting I've, to look at it. I've 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 I have very few friends my own age to be honest with you. I love old movies. I love old music. I love all of that. I'm an old soul. I can tell from just reading a little bit about you, but um, anyway, let me do, if you would like to hear the story about yes <laughs> the harpooning scene, the famous scene, and I I got to be the cover girl, but I had nothing to do with the script. Yeah, which insulted me greatly because I was already trying to write. Uh, nevertheless, I, um, I had to go up the canyon. There are a lot of beautiful canyons in, in and around Salt Lake City. Right. And uh, Jonathan and I went scouting because John grew up in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. and we knew everything about every canyon. And we went up to Albion Basin. It was filmed in the summer, and it was over 100 degrees. This is back in the day. This yeah. is an exceptionally hot weekend. And when you go way high up in the canyon, there's no water stars. There's <laughs> miles and miles away. Uh, you, you can't get any water. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the harpooning scene had to do with being strapped with glycerin and barbecue sauce. <laughs> and Jim, despite the, the, the movie, wanted this to be you know, his magnum opus, or at least he wanted it to be a success. He thought he could make it into a success. Right, because he'd, he'd um, come from porn in the 70s. <laughs> that's true, which is what he, he, he gravitated towards after, I believe, that film, although he may have made something else. But yeah. um, a bit then before he moved back to California. Anyway, he, um, I, I was strapped up with these tubes mm -hmm. that went under my arms and up through my collar and... I had to somehow, I can't remember how I got it. I had some sort of hat contraption where where the hat fell off or something, and, and I was harpooned to the canvas, and people were squeezing, like, these little blood pressure, you know, those blood pressure cuffs, those little bulbs. Yeah. And in this heat, so this uh, barbecue sauce and glycerin would come out, and it would appear to be in my mouth, but it was mostly through my hair. And I had long, not strawberry blonde like the picture, but auburn curls. Uh, and the scene he did about, I want to say 10 takes. I don't know where they came up with this stuff, but they reused the barbecue sauce. And in that heat, I was, I thought I was being at one point scorched alive. Yeah. And so I had to travel all the way when it was finally done, starting at like 7 o'clock in the morning, we'd start to set up. And these are, you know, looking all kinds of things. Um, at, you know, and the camera, and John, I mean, um, Jim got strips of old film. Mm -hmm. He couldn't even afford a full reel, so he had these strips, and he had to do every single take and pull out these things in, a, in an old camera, in a black felt bag. Yeah. So that there was, there was long periods of time where he was changing the film and screaming bloody murder because he didn't get the take, and then he they put on this other crappy short scrap of film that he managed to scrounge. Anyway, after multiple, multiple ta takes, John and I went down the canyon and I could not even see for the barbecue sauce. <laughs> and I couldn't get it off. I think I, I think I took off most of my, I think about a third of my hair. I'm not joking because I couldn't <laughs> get it out. And my face was on fire. So for days, this I think it was like two weeks, and I lost a, a chunk of hair Ooh. in my back. But it burned my scalp so severely that I had to walk around with a, like a baseball cap on because it was so bad. Yeah. That's how bad that scene was and how hot it was. So don't go in the woods was very uh, apt title for me. Yeah. The, the subtitle is Without Water, uh, and a lot of it. That was, that's, that's the harpooning scene. 
Wow. Went to that, what, that, so that blood was barbecue sauce? It, it looks kind of magenta colored. And, and glycerin and, and food coloring, mm-hmm. which, of course, Kathy Bryan uh, cooked up in the kitchen. What did Kathy not do? She made these science fiction animals. I mean, she was amazingly talented. Um, and her sister-in-law, Jim's sister, was she lived in Texas, and she was also a, a costume person and... Eventually, Kathy opened up a shop with her sister-in-law called Zumba Marumba. You would have liked Kathy because she loved old things and 50s costumes with real cherries sewn on flare felt skirts with poodles and I mean, all, all that kind of thing. Just incredibly talented. And I think Jim was a very gifted person. I just don't think he went after the greatest script in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, Jonathan and I both advised him, and he kind of poo pooed that idea. And maybe <laughs> I was wrong. Maybe I was just jealous. Probably I was jealous because uh, he didn't did, choose my script. Not that I had written one. Yeah. <laughs> did, did Did he give you any kind of direction for uh, your screaming? Because you're screaming, you sound like you're having an orgasm in that scene. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that. Maybe my inspiration was my own home. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember that he gave any direction at all. Uh, Jim had two modes, Mm -hmm. and that was he was both jolly and kind and giggled softly, not not aloud, or this screaming, raging lunatic. And then he was always a very private person. So they had a some sort of little dog breed, a very sweet dog, and they called him Dog. (laughs) <laughs> I think. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, but I think I think he had a lot of talent, and I understand he had a lot of talent in in sound, and it took him a long time. And I think I'm not sure about this, but my husband remembers that the scriptwriter. One of the reasons that he chose the script was because the guy was putting in his money to help. <laughs> You know, everybody in those days, it was magical. You know, you were yeah. part of, you were actually making a movie with a real movie camera. And somebody had gone to UCLA in film school. And somebody who knew about the business and hadn't worked in the business as right. a sound editor. So it was, he, was, he was legit. I, Later, I, I think he, he did some porn films. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. what I remember seeing one in his house, and I thought, are you kidding? But... <laughs> When I went to UCLA years later, they said, if you want to make a film, make a horror film, because they're much easier to sell. These are in the days of, of course, Roger Corman, and right. that, was, that was something to aspire to. And why not? Right. It was a much more smaller community uh, back then, too, in Hollywood. Um, even, though the ho- even though horror was the kind of the bastard stepchild of the industry... You know, I mean, it could still make a profit no matter what, whether it's um, theatrical or on home video, you know, and now it's it's hard to get um, any horror film distributed these days. Yeah, and he must have known plenty because he he did get it made, and I remember it was, uh, the opening was on this this huge theater, and so, well, not huge, but it seemed large. You know, nowadays with these boutique theaters, it looked large by comparison. And somewhere, I have a picture of that marquee, and it was in January. It was ice cold, which just struck me as kind of interesting. But we did get to do some great shots. One of the places that Jonathan and I went was up uh, Cottonwood Canyon, which Little Cottonwood Canyon is where... Alta is and Snowbird in Utah for the skiers. But in the summer, at the time, it was filled with Indian paintbrush and lupin. And we got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and drove up. It's quite a distance, and it's straight uphill. It's at about mm, 8,500 to 9,000 feet. Well, that's too much. Yeah, pretty close. Maybe 8,000, that's for sure. I'm not sure what the top is, because we climbed to the tippy top where there's a like a, almost a mesa, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Jim was going to fly. He had somebody who had a plane, a small plane, and we couldn't imagine it, but we got to the highest precipice, and we had 
we had shown him where it was, but we were alone. And we lay on this mesa for hours and never saw a plane. <laughs> Once again, we had had no breakfast, but we were young. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at the top of a canyon, that was really hard to come down. Most of the time I came down on my rear end because it was vertiginous and it was just, um, just scary, uh, scary wide. Right. Um, yeah, during this time, there was a lot of slasher movies made particularly in a rustic uh, wilderness area. There was uh, Just Before Dawn, The Forest, The Prey, a lot of them. And um, this was one of those ones that uh, got distributed by Vestron Video on VHS, and it became a, uh, a cult favorite, as a matter of fact. Um, who's, I was curious, who's, oh who's, whose baby was it in that scene? Was that your baby? Yes, that was supposed to be my baby. And I remember also, by the way, I was wearing, I don't wear these anymore. Being a dancer, you just get out of the habit because your feet are so crappy anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, I was in both modern. Modern is when you have, and jazz, and and you're in barefoot. <laughs> so <laughs> your feet are really screwed up. It's almost as bad as toe shoes with, um and that's what I was studying at the University of Utah, or had studied. By mm. then I was out of dancing. Um, and I wore these old, really almost Melania height, uh, uh, up to the knee black boots that zipped up, and they were very tight in those days. They weren't loose. They weren't, uh, you know, they were city boots for right. walking around Manhattan. And in this 102 degree weather, and I'm in the woods, literally walking in stiletto heels and, and being <laughs> harpooned to a canvas. That was the same day as the barbecue sauce. So I think I retired those boots covered in that sauce. <laughs> and I've never liked barbecue sauce ever since. Anything that even, and same with Jonathan. And Jonathan would eat chew leather if, if that's available, but not the kind with barbecue sauce. Oh, I love all barbecue sauce. I'm a big barbecue sauce yep. guy. Are you are you trained in all types of dancing, even tap? Yes, I had my own tap troupe for a while in California. I shouldn't say my own. There <laughs> were six of us, and we were called we called ourselves the Tappers from Hell. Again, we did some performances, and I, I wasn't a bad tap dancer. I had um, I got to study at the, like you. I was friends with these people who were just about to die, you know. Yeah. And I even had classes with Gregory Hines, but even much older than he, like Sandman Sims and Eddie Brown. You wouldn't know these people, but they were like in their 80s. Uh, and Jimmy DeFore. I got to study with all of these greats, with the Nicholas brothers. And one of them was dead. Mm -hmm. It was Thayer Nicholas, who had had two hip replacements. He was in his 80s. I mean, I had these classes with these tap greats, and uh, so then had some really great training. And for a while, I did tap dancing, and uh, maybe 10, 12 years, I think. So that was kind of fun. Nice. But, so I followed up on a little on my dancing, and a lot on my drama. But I always wanted to be, you know, as my father mm -hmm. took me to that early play that he took me to, and going to see Camelot, you know. Yeah. I wanted to be in the theater, in the theater. Um, so I ended up being in the theater for for a while, making, you know, having my my day on the stage. Uh, got do, to be a writer and a dancer, but not an actress. Do, do you paint? That's another thing. That acting, though, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Go ahead. You want to ask me something? I was going to ask you. Do you paint at all? Um, I like to draw. I'm, I'm, uh, I am representational, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have any creative thoughts in my head. I can look at a flower and reproduce it. Not a great artist. <laughs> uh, but some uh, um, drawing skill. I'm good at language, and I think I'm good at math. It's interesting. Um, when I was growing up, you had to take a test in New York City you know, mm -hmm. before you went to college college called the Cooter Preference Test, I don't know whatever happened to it, which had to do with what you would be good at when you grew up. And the answer came back, I'd be excellent at math or anything that involved numbers. So 
I became a playwright and a tap dancer. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. That's not... That's not bad. So close to the line that you could barely tell the difference. I could have been working on Wall Street, you know? Yeah. But, um, Oh, thank God you didn't look at it now. <laughs> With it's, it's, you know, they've. Oh my God! I, not I'd be in jail probably, but yeah. I also did not have larceny in my heart, uh, which is too bad. I think people who go into the the movies or theater, they, you know, obviously they're not in it, you know, for the money. Right. It, that would be. I can't imagine the, the, the slimmer percentile. You would do better to put money in a, a piggy bank. Yeah, um, I couldn't think of one either. Do you still talk to anybody from the movie? Oh, gosh, no. No. Um, I do have some of Kathy Bryant's paintings hanging in my house or my sofa to this day. Some beautiful canvases. Um, and, uh, but... Uh, but Aside from that, no, you know, life is kind of like the, the train station where you land in one train stops and the other train stops and you get out and you meet on the platform and then you get on other trains and they go in different directions. Right. Um, and but I saw uh, Jim and Kathy for a little bit when we first moved to, when Jonathan and I first moved to uh, California, to, to Newport Beach. We <clears throat> Um, that was in 1984. I think I saw them maybe three times. Mm -hmm. uh, it just sort of fizzled, and Kathy then moved to Texas. I think that they were they were, they were still an item, but I don't know. I don't. I think, and we went to visit Kathy in Texas. Uh -huh. uh, but that was that was the end. I think there were Christmas cards for a couple of years. Although Jim was never a Christmas card kind of guy. Yeah. And uh, he was not a traditional man in any way. And I think that he fell outside the, the family business. I don't know what that was, but he was exceptionally smart, very talented, very closed mouth. Yeah. He never knew what Jim was thinking. I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to, to talk to him. Because I think he was brilliant, but yeah. he was a man of few words. It's okay. There's a couple horror horror directors uh, I'd never get to talk to because they either died or they're just so old now, and they, they're not on social media much. And it, it's fine, you know, as long as I get to talk to actors. But there's 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 a, there's a couple of them I've gotten to talk to. I've been so lucky with. But um, who, who in particular have you enjoyed talking to? Of um, just overall, like like who are my best interviews? Well, yeah, I mean, why, I guess I want to ask you, how come you got into it? What, you just loved the movies and loved this genre in particular? Uh, yeah, I, I love horror, sci-fi, comedy. You know, I'm a big comedy guy. You know, I did stand-up for 10 years. I used to entertain my family after yeah. dinner when I was a kid. Yeah. And... Oh, I admire that. Wow, that takes real guts. Oh, it's overrated. Stand up is overrated. I don't suggest anybody get involved in it. <laughs> I love it when it's going on. I just don't love being a part of it. It's just it's very backstabbing and there's just a lot of bullshit that needs to be corrected and I'm hoping someday um somebody's going to take a stand and say, you know, we need to be treated just like the actors, you know, we should have our own union. We should, you know, get this and that, you know, it's just, there's a lot of, of bullshit in the, in the stand-up industry that needs to be changed, but. Oh, I, I think there's a lot in every industry that needs to be changed. I, um, oh yeah, acting is I, another one. I believe in that too. I believe in, in meritocracy and unfortunately people make decisions based on who's buddy buddy with who and all of that crap and it needs to stop because I, it's ruining a lot of people's careers and lives i think it, it's true it actually something terrible and i won't go into it but something yeah. terrible happened to me in theater in which you know it's a backstabbing thing somebody i've <coughs> been a friend for a mm. long time right. uh and i was slotted to have a, a play produced you know I, I i was being produced at regional theaters and even had a reading at Manhattan Theater Club. Oh, and the Manhattan Theater Club story, you know, sidebar, but 
I had had this play produced. They wanted to produce it at Manhattan Theater Club. And I had made an arrangement to teach at Santa Barbara, University of Santa, uh, California at Santa Barbara, that weekend. It was a, an entire weekend thing that had been planned for a year. And I didn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't attend the reading. And the woman called me, the literary manager, and said, mm -hmm. you know, you should know that because you aren't here, we're not going to produce the play. Oh. Um, and I thought, what? And it was Marcia Gay Harden and, you know, all of these um, Kelsey Grammer did mm -hmm. the reading. Unbelievable. And I couldn't make it because I had another commitment. Um. Well, and I'm sure that it's happened on a much grander scale than that. But, it, it, you know, that's how punitive and pusillanimous it was. And um, But um, what can you do? I've also had some wonderful times. I've worked for... Um, uh, Leonard Nimoy and worked yeah. for him for several years as a, as a writer for mm -hmm. his alien voices. So just in case you're interested in the science fiction aspect, but I, I was not an actress. <laughs> <laughs> so if you knew him, you probably knew Tamar Hoffs. You know, I knew, I, I only knew the early ones. I knew John Delancey had been in my first play that was produced for National Public Radio. Mm -hmm. He played Q. And I got them together and then there was a thing that toured across this country oh I'm sorry this, the wind is blowing and the door was shut it's okay um, so the they they toured anyway I, I introduced Q and Spock because they had never met in any of the later iterations um, mm -hmm. I did know Kate Mulgrew but yeah and I know some of the earlier ones and um some of the earlier people, but um, and that's what I did with with Leonard and and John, and it was that was great fun. That was a great group of people who had been together, and they were very generous. They were at a, a level of professionalism where there was nothing backbiting. It was just easy breezy. I think well, that was a piece of luck, though. You know, I, I understand other stories are just end in sorrow, so which is too bad because it can be. It can be tremendous fun. Um, all of it, you know, the movie magic. It can be, yeah. I mean, from this movie, I mean, Gail, I mean, Mary Gail Arts. I mean, she went on to a huge career. Yeah, so I read. I didn't know until I was I uh, after you called. I looked on IMDb and found out what happened. Isn't that something? I know. I will. That's really great. Every low-budget horror movie from the early 80s has at least one person who didn't fall into B-movie obscurity who actually had a huge career <laughs> afterwards, you know? I mean, even though Friday the 13th is not obscure, I mean, Kevin Bacon, you know, obviously became a huge star after that movie. Yeah, uh, uh, my husband was telling me a story about Kevin Bacon where he, he wanted to find out what it was like to be... He dressed up as a, an old woman... And nobody recognized him on the street in Manhattan, and it, it really upset him. <laughs> he couldn't live in obscurity because he was so used to being Kevin Bacon. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, I remember Kevin Bacon when he was on The Guiding Light. I did not meet him, but I ended up writing, so that was my first TV writing gig at The Guiding Light. Oh, gosh. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah. I, I think that you should make a book. You should write a book. Oh, I am. Uh, <laughs> are you? Yeah. Are you? I've been writing a book since, really? since January, yeah. I'm taking a break right now from writing it because I've been crying a lot writing it because I'm revealing a lot of personal information I've never revealed about my life and my uh, my gravitation to towards cult films and stuff. Really? Yeah. Um, well... I'm going to throw this out there, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I, recently, I, you know, life doesn't go in a straight line. I'm sure you've figured that. If you're over 25, you've figured that out. 38. And 38, so you, you definitely know. Yeah. So you, things happen. And more recently, after teaching for 19 years, I also taught a lot, um, writing. I got interested in memoir writing, and then I right. got interested in helping people write their memoirs. So I've helped people, a lot of Holocaust survivors, I myself am not Jewish, write 
their memoirs mm-hmm. and um, be with them and, and, and other kinds of things. But it is a wholly different and really amazing mm-hmm. experience. So I put it out there to you if you ever need some advice or somebody to help read your pages, I'd be happy to to offer that to you if that means anything. Oh, I appreciate that. I'll let you know. Yeah, it's gonna take a it's gonna take a while before I finish it, but I, I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, I talked to I talked I talked to a friend recently about uh, she took a, a a memoir writing class, and I was just like, wow, God, that's a new phenomenon now. Memoir writing classes. Don't don't you teach one? I've taught one. I taught one for several years, and then I stopped teaching it and just decided I'm gonna. Somebody asked me if I could. One of the students asked me if I could help. She couldn't do it because you can't just learn it. You have to be, you know, know something about writing. I think it's just too hard. You get the rudiments. But so I recommend though the best thing is having a writers group. Uh, mm-hmm. There's something about it, and I guess because I got a a master's degree and I already had success in the theater and in television, and then I went back and got a master's degree, and I thought, I have no idea. I had no idea how a movie was put together, and I thought I knew everything. Well, I didn't. I knew nothing. And in being in a group, you learn, or they they leapfrogs you past the neophyte errors, and I I couldn't recommend it more highly. I still have a writing group, and uh, two of us are writing a memoir, but I've also had a bunch of these other books published. Uh, mm-hmm. And another guy helped write a book. Uh, my professor at UCLA published two b- books on film. In fact, I rewrote them. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> nice. Uh, I was curious. Yeah, so... Mm-hmm. I, was, I, was cu- I was curious. Why did you change the uh, spelling of your name for the movie? I didn't. That was, uh, you know, that was an error that had nothing to do with me. Okay. I was, cu- I was just curious. What? You know, my, it's, it's two eyes. Yeah. Not e. I saw that. I have no idea how people do that. <laughs> um, was there was there a rap party for the movie? There was. And once again, it was incredibly creative. And people, uh, Jim and Kathy Bryan had this small house in Salt Lake City, and we went around there, and, um, and, um, so, so it was lovely with unusual snacks and stuff, and I think I contributed because I like to cook. And we we had one outside mm-hmm. at the bottom of a canyon, not at the very tippity top, so nobody was dying of heat. And by then it got there were times I remember uh, it went into the fall, um, and so it got very crisp in Salt Lake, in the canyons, it can get very cold. And in fact, I believe there was snow one night and we had Klieg lights and somebody at nighttime tripped over the Klieg light and we could have created a, a major fire or accident, you know, in the middle of really very dense woods. Uh, so, uh, but that's where we had one, there were two parties actually, I do remember that. And there was uh, another party when for the opening. Mm-hmm. That was in January. I don't remember that very well. Cold, something cold. Um, those yeah. grand mm. days. I wish I could. I, I'm not the star of the movie. Yeah. And yet I'm the only one able to talk, except for the, my bird watcher husband. <laughs> uh, Was there a uh, screening for the movie? Yes, in in January, and we all got to go, and everybody came back from wherever they were. Most most of them, I think, were in Los Angeles, and. Uh, Mm-hmm. It it was fun, but I was I I did the you know scouting for uh, places to shoot with. I you know I did I was a what do you call it? Um, I did all kinds of things. Uh, John helped on uh, be a, a grip and nearly killed himself any number of times, and um, mm-hmm. I helped Kathy with costumes and I have zero skill at sewing anything but there were last minute changes and makeup and making food and making this and so on all kinds of things but especially the uh, scouting for places uh, and we found these beautiful places that 
Jim and Kathy would not ordinarily have gone to. I don't think it was their cup of tea mm-hmm. marching up, you know, very steep canyons. Right. Uh, but it, it surely was a beautiful place. And we filmed in Emigration Canyon, Big Cottonwood Canyon, which is not where the ski is, skiing is, but right. it's still high. And then Little Cottonwood Canyon is the highest. Uh, and in Albion Basin, which is at the top of Little Cottonwood, I don't know if you know any of this area by any chance. Not really. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. no. So that's okay. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful state. Um, somewhat despoiled these days with air quality, but at the time it was pretty damn gorgeous. Oh. Am I allowed to say that? Oh, you can say anything you want. Swear, swear all you want. There's uh, nothing offends me, and nothing offends whoever listens to this. <laughs> uh, so, I, who else have you interviewed besides? I, I mean, apparently nobody else from Don't Go in the Woods. You're the only one I've interviewed from Don't Go in the Woods. Yeah, you're the only one I've been able to find, other than Jim, you know, who can't do it, obviously, but, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. Um, yeah, we had some great days with, with Jim and Kathy, but you you should call my husband, you know, at some point. Uh, okay. If you want the bird watch your point of view. <laughs> at some point, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just I'm I'm focusing on bucket list people these days. I I, I put my foot down um, because I was get, I was I was getting a lot of recommendations, and the recommendations of people were were extremely rude and mean to me. And what? yeah, what I've learned. What? Let me tell you what I've learned. Just because you're recommending somebody who's nice to you doesn't mean they're going to be nice to me because they don't know who I am. They're just doing a favor for a friend and they think that they're above me, you know? <laughs> That's what I've learned o- over the years. And this year I've really put my foot down and I've, I've placed boundaries, you know? I say, no, I'm only going to interview people that I want to interview on my list, you know? And that's all there is to it, you know? But... I mean, I mean, obviously, you got a great husband to have been with him for so long. I wouldn't mind talking to him in the future, but I'm just saying, in general, I, I, I'm just interviewing people on my list. You know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I just that's a, that's sad to hear. They feel above you. Wow. Well, they don't say that, You're of doing course. That's so important. Well, yeah. I know, but you can feel it. You can feel it. I mean, I've I've interviewed big names that were just friggin' amazing. I've talked to Tommy Chong, Ed Asner, Eric Roberts, um, just some great people. And But then there's been a couple people in there that just really disappointed me. And, you know, nothing you can do, but, you know, at least I'm glad I, could, I did it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough place to be. It, it, you know, I watch journalist like being a stand-up but at least you're alone you're not you're not being uh condescended to by somebody so uh, but i've seen journalists on television i don't know how they take it they take the um you know the, the um, oh they take the hatred the- yeah. Oh, they take it on the air, but but off the air they don't tolerate that shit. I've I've heard many things of you know bitching them out, saying, well, you know, why the fuck did you do this interview if you're going to treat me like that on the air? You know. Good. Yeah. They, good somebody said something. Yeah. I, I think I would go into a room and cower in the co- corner. Hmm. Yeah. Um, oh. Oh, uh, there's. I mean, um, I, I even directed some some plays in the theater, you know, in smaller theaters, and I've been, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed it a lot, because I like to direct actors, it turns out, not act. And what I know is that they get, they're, generally, this is my impression, they're so generous. So I got to mm-hmm. do a, a play that starred Michael York. Do you know who Michael York is? Oh, yes, from Logan's Run and Austin Powers and all of that. Exactly, exactly. So, uh... And for some reason, he got to be, and he's an opera fan, and I was writing a play for, you don't need to know, but anyway, he, <laughs> he was in it. And I got to direct him, and, you know, I couldn't believe how humble he was. He came in, uh, I thought, oh, 
going to be direct Michael York. Yeah. This is embarrassing. What do I know? Yeah. And um, he came in with about three suits because it was a live performance of a play. And he said, what do you think? And he was showing me all these clothes. Could you help me pick this out? And then sometimes when during the rehearsal, I would say, you know, stop or... You know, Michael, is it possible that you could do that louder? I mean, I, was, I can't believe I had the nerve to actually say it. Oh, sure, sure. You know, there was never a moment. This is what I mean by this level of professionalism that you get to. Yeah. You think, wow. It's always some person who thinks they're great, and he realizes he's not great. And maybe that has a little bit to do with age, but then I understand people are bastards all through their lives, and it doesn't <laughs> change. <laughs> Yeah, some people do, some people don't. But I was cu- I was curious. So, uh, what made you get into teaching? For one thing, I knew that they, I would never make a living. There was a hit or miss, and for a while, I made some nice money in the theater. Surprising at the time, like um, thirty years ago, I pulled in for one play. One play, I think it was a six week five or six week run at original theater it was like 52 grand it was uh, unbelievable you know it was a rather large large ish theater and uh but i recognized that that would ha- over the course of a year or two as long as it took me to write another play and if if my life went like that and it didn't i mean i did have other plays produced you know but my my timeline was thrown off but i knew somewhere in you, oh, this is not going to work. I mean, all you have to do is read a few statistics. Uh, right. Females don't. You know, there are 11% of the plays written are written by women. Mm-hmm. And almost, like was at the time, 98% of them are directed by men. And right. so on and so forth. You have to put blinders on, but also a reality check and start to teach. And I did. I started to teach, and I, I really, I really loved it. Um, you, and I, I miss it. I miss it tremendously. Actually, uh-huh. uh, I stopped teaching. During the um, in 2009, I was rift because of the economic turndown after teaching for 15 years at uh, Long Beach City College, uh, and then I was uh, rift from South Coast Repertory. Same problem after 19 years of teaching. But you know what? Frankly, I needed the break, and I liked the 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 community college level better because the kids were, were needy and it was in a multicultural community. Right. Uh, Hispanic, black, and Asian. And, you know, some white, but, but mostly not. And they really can't wait to be educated, which is a lot different from teaching in a theater where it was sort of a little bit snobby. People come in and they're a little bit entitled, as, it, as in a lot entitled. Yeah. So uh, that, that one I miss a lot less. Uh, than the teaching, the nitty gritty, that uh, the people who really wanted to be, wanted to learn, wanted to make. You know, these are people who are either be in prison, or they had been in prison, yeah. or they had somebody in their family who were in prison, and they were going to make a go of it. And that was, you know, to me, an honor. Talk about a privilege. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> It really was. It was. A, it, it makes all the difference as opposed to somebody saying, "Well, I don't like your criticism of my play." Oh, for God's sake! Yeah. Um. <laughs> I know you can't win sometimes. Um, do you have Do you have any um, projects you're working on, like any books or anything like that? I do. Uh, I am right now working on. It. I am. I think about two thirds or three quarters of the way through a rewrite of a memoir that it's, I took a class after, years after I got my MFA at UCLA. I went back and took a class in memoir writing. There we go. Mm-hmm. And I, then I started to actually write books, you know, as I told you, on the side seven, I think. And I never got to it. And finally, I decided this year I'm going to do it. So I, it was a promise during the pandemic that I started to write this book. And I have, and it's about a, uh, it's a, it's a memoir, which is not a, an autobiography. I mean, it, it's a little chapter of a life. And it takes place uh, from the time I was six till the time I was uh, 13. And 
and, that, and that's what I'm writing right now. And I also have plans to write a, a play uh, based on, loosely based on an Italian group that I had, an Italian speaking group for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now disbanded, but uh, it took up a chunk of my life. I have an Italian heart and there's not a drop of Italian blood in me. Interesting. That's what I'm working on. Thank you for asking. You, you, so you had a heart transplant? No. no. Oh. Heart? What do you mean? I thought you said you I had a heart. Uh, I thought you I, said... I, I have an Ita Italian heart, meaning... Oh, okay. Meaning my love for Italy. I gotcha, gotcha. I thought you said you had a, an Italian <laughs> Italian person's heart or something. Uh, no, no, no. I'm a, I'm, I'm a well person. Um, let's see... There's a there's a place of poetry that says, "Open my heart and you shall see, in letters large, writ Italy, something like that." I'm probably absolutely ruining the quote, but it's some famous poet, and I can't tell you who. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's about my feeling about Italy and my fantastic Italian teacher gone these several years, and she would be close to a hundred. So wow. I learned a lot. Yeah. See how, how that was that train and that pulled into the station and then everybody got off. But I'm left with the Italian class, so I'm thinking about that as a play. Nice. It's just kind of a, a, a closed, if you write plays nowadays during the pandemic, it better be one person and on Zoom. So I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and it better be uh, somebody famous. That, right. needs to, that needs to be, that just wants to act, you know, something like that. Right. So I don't know how I pull off an Italian class. Probably not. <laughs> well, I hope that book works out well for you, and I thank you so much for Thanks. coming on today. Oh, it's fun. Uh, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. And again, the offer still stands about any advice, in case you need advice. Uh, free! Free! Um, I'd be happy on on your own on your own uh, memoir when you get back to it. Well, I will let you know, and I thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate it. It was so much fun to talk to you, Tommy. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Well, you have right. yourself a great day, and please stay safe. Okay, you too. Take care. Bye bye now. Okay, bye bye. Well, there you have it. Cecilia Fannin, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a great lady, huh? It was a nice little talk there, and I'm glad we got to talk about Don't Go in the Woods. If you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. It's very entertaining. Welp, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!